Hey guys, welcome to Code Decode. In this video, we are going to cover some interview questions asked in Cape Gemini. At the end of this video, we are going to demonstrate how to explain such topics that you have never worked upon. For example, you have never worked upon a microservice architecture. You have always been working with a monolithic one. But in you have to anyways crack an interview with microservices, otherwise they will not reject the profile. Then how to answer such questions deliberately and diplomatically, we will be trying to cover that also in the last part of this video. So let's get started. Describe in general how Java's garbage collector works. Okay, so in Java, the garbage collector has a generational mark and sweep strategy for garbage collecting the objects which are not being used currently. So what is mark and sweep technology that is being used? So mark and sweep are the phases. So basically this mark and sweep garbage collector has three phases. First is marking where all the objects are in the first phase marked as alive. Then in the second phase, the memories which are not marked or those which are dead objects are garbage collected by the garbage collector. Third and the optional step is the compaction step. Since the dead objects are not going to be necessarily next to each other. Hence, the fragmented memory causes problem in allocating new objects. So that is why you can do the compaction by collecting all the empty spaces at one place in the heap at the start of the heap so that it is easy to allocate memory to new objects subsequently and sequentially. So that was the mark and sweep technology that is being used by garbage collector. It is also a generational garbage collector. The generational strategy categorizes the object by age and it works on the principle that most of the object that you allocate in Java die young. So here our heap space is divided into young, old and common and generation. The young space also consists of add-in space and two survivor spaces. The add-in space is where all the new objects are initially allocated and survivor spaces are once the minor garbage collection happens of the young generation, the live objects moves from add-in space to either survivor 0 or survivor 1 space. The rest two are old generation and permanent generation. When the young generation is full, the minor garbage collection is invoked on the young generation. And when the old generation and the common generation gets full with the objects, then major garbage collection is eventually invoked, which is often very slower than the minor garbage collector. The change that has hap happened with Java 8 is the perm generation is now replaced with the meta space. Initially, perm gen generation was a static sized allocated in heap which causes out of memory exception key now and then. Hence, it is replaced with meta space, which is automatically resized so that it avoids the problem of application running out of memory due to limit, limited size of the perm generation. So what are the methods of object class? So object class, as we all know, is the parent of all the classes available. We don't have to explicitly extend it. It is by default extended by each and every object created in the application. So the few methods are already there in the object class, which we can override and give our implementation or use it as it is. Few of them are equals method to compare objects content. Second is the hash code. It gives the hash, it prints or returns the hexadecimal hash code of the object. That is the memory location actually where the object is created. In the equals, it compares the content if you override it. And if you don't override it, the default implementation of object is the double equal to which actually compares the memory reference where the object is created. The two string method returns a string representation of an object. If you don't override it, it basically prints you the memory location again. The clone creates the and returns the exact copy of the object. That, that's basically the two types of cloning, the deep cloning and the shallow cloning. That's, that's done with the clone. So you have to extend the clonable and uh, override this clone method of the object class. The get class method returns the class object of that particular object. It, this contains the metadata about the class. And finalize is the method that is used by garbage collector just before garbage collecting your object. Then we have notify to wake up a single thread waiting on the object's monitor. Then we have notify all that is waking up all threads waiting for the object monitor or the object logs to be retrieved. Then there is a wait method which causes a current thread to wait for a particular millisecond timeout until the thread is get notified with notify notify all then there is overloaded method of timeout and with the nanoseconds in the time so the current thread has to wait for specified milliseconds and nanoseconds until the thread invokes the notify notify all the last one is this await overloaded wait with no argument 
it causes a current thread to wait as long as the thread does not uh, invokes the notify and notify all. So these were all the methods of the object classes. Which access specifiers can be used with top level class? So we know that there are four types of access specifiers, public, private, protected and default. Default with no keyword. For the class, we can only use two access specifiers that is public and default. We cannot use protected or private in the class level. Okay. What is an immutable class? An immutable class means the object of that particular class once created can never be modified or changed. In Java, we already have some wrapper classes like Boolean, short, integer, long, float, double, byte, character, string, which are immutable classes. Now, why, why do we really need immutable classes in our application? We need to create a class as immutable class in Java because its hash code can be easily cached. Cache means it can be easily kept in cache. Why? Because the hash codes, the object's hash code will never change. It can never be uh, modified. Since the class can never be modified, the new uh, memory will not be ever allocated and the hash code will never be changed. So, object's hash code can be easily cache. The, it is it is always a good choice for the keys in the maps. We always say that the keys in the map should always be immutable. Like, for example, that is why we use string and the boolean and wrapper classes. So, if you create your own class immutable, you can use it as a key into your maps. And then it is also good for multi-threaded movement because the object state won't change. Your multi-thread can never harm your object. How to create an immutable class? Now, since immutable classes are that beneficial, the way there is a way in Java to make each and every class immutable class. The way to do that is make your custom class final, first of all. So, once you make it final, it cannot be inherited and cannot be modified at all. Mm. Secondly, when it comes to the variables, mark all the mutable fields immutable by making it finalizing and initializing them in constructor. And while initializing them in constructor, use the deep clone so that you don't refer to existing variable and that variable doesn't change in memory. So, always use deep cloning while initializing the constructor. If you have any doubt in why, why do we need to deep clone while constructor initialization, you have to let me know in the comment section. I'll create a separate video on that. I'm focusing only on the interview question this time. Thirdly, create all the getters and no setters so that you know you cannot set any state of the variable state of the object you can only just get it and also while getting it return the deep clone so that nobody can change the reference even if you return a mutable field in the getters so always return the deep clone so while creating also use the deep clone while returning also use the deep clone uh, what's the difference between load and get okay so in hibernate Load and get are the two methods to fetch an object from the database. Now, the load is by default lazily loaded. Hence, it does not usually hit the database until unless you do not fetch any attribute from that object that you are getting through the database apart from the ID. But get always goes to database and fetch the real object rather than getting the proxy. So, many a times load is much more faster than get because get usually do the real hitting to the database. While proxy doesn't hit the database until unless you really try to fetch something out of that object. So, load is lazy loaded, get is eager loaded. Now, load, if you find try to find something out of it and doesn't find that particular object in the database, it will throw an exception object not found and will abort your program then and there. But get will always return null if it doesn't find an op object in the database. So, if you are very sure that object exists in the database, then only use load, else use the get method if you are not, not sure about the object's existence in the database. Okay. What is criteria in Hibernate? So, criteria is a simplified API for retrieving entities by composing a criterion object. So, you have select uh, query, right? The way to implement that in Hibernate is with a criteria object. So, you always have session, you create session from the session factory. Now, from the session factory, you create a criteria, you create the session, then you create the criteria. You create a criteria on a particular class and add the restrictions. So, these restrictions are the where clauses of that particular query. So, this will internally be creating a select star from employee where name starts with A or and list of all such employees will be returned. So, it will return all employees whose name are starting with A. What are the ways to break singleton pattern? So, singleton design pattern is having only one and one object in the memory for a particular class. Now, 
are there any ways are there are many ways in which you can break the singleton design pattern and have multiple objects of the same class the first is through reflection second is the class loader loading the same class <laughs> multiple times then you will have multiple objects of it if the class is serializable or clonable then you can serialize and deserialize and create another object of it and clone it and create a deep clone or shallow clone it and create another object of it these three are the easy ways of breaking the singleton pattern but if you have not used double check blocking in your singleton design pattern then it can be easily broken with multi threaded environment also if two 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 threads simultaneously try to get an object and run the method where new object is created then two new objects will be created so total four ways to break singleton pattern is through reflection multiple class loaders in the application uh, serializable clonable and the multi threading what is the difference between application dot properties and application dot yaml so in a spring boot application we always know that it's the spring boot who scans the class path searches for src main resources and search for application dot properties or application dot yaml file but spring boot always give preference to application dot yaml file and loads it first in the memory but what happens is if the both are there application dot property are there and application dot yaml is also there then preference is given to yaml file so yaml has more preference over dot properties file but if both of them have the common properties then since dot properties loaded later on hence it will overwrite the properties from the dot yaml one so preference is given to yaml but since it is loaded later hence the preference is given to property common properties of the dot properties file secondly yaml supports key value pair map list scalar types but the dot properties does does not support anything beyond string so it knows only string while yaml knows all the other types also yaml is usually used in many prevalent languages like python ruby and java but dot properties are usually used in java only yaml follows a hierarchical structure also but dot properties does not understand any kind of hierarchical structure it is simple plain string that you can assign to a property and if you are using spring profiles you have to have separate profiling properties for each dev qa test prod everything but in yaml you can have multiple profiles in a single yaml file using the dash dash uh, technique technique there is a way in which you can define multiple profiles also in single yaml file and while retrieving value from yaml you can get the respective data type that is in string map list as per the configuration but in the case of dot property file you can always retrieve the strings regardless of whatever the actual type of that particular configuration is even if it is int it is going to be returned to you in string then you have to integer dot parse in that particular string because proper dot properties only as understand one data type that is string so that is why yaml is always preferred over properties file explain hibernate caching mechanism okay so caching is a mechanism of loading an object from main memory to a cache where it can be quickly retrieved and you don't have to have a overload of hitting the database again and again the advantage of caching is that when we want to get load the same object from the database that instead of hitting the database you can get it from the local memory only so the number of round trip times reduces and hence the database hit score reduces and hence the performance increases for every session that you create from a session factory each session has its own first level cache by default created and that is a session cache created in hibernate but there is also a second level cache because as soon as your cache evicts or say a session is uh, closed all your cached objects get lost so if you want to cache more than be or beyond a session then you have a second level cache that is session factory for you that is that is not enabled by default and you have to enable with some properties how one dao implementation object can handle multiple requests okay so here interviewer is asking that since the spring creates an object and that object by default has a scope of singleton that means you have one dao singleton object present in your memory then if two requests simultaneously get hits by to the application that fetch employee and update an employee then how will this two requests simultaneously be accepted by one object which is singleton because singleton means there is only one object in the heap so you have to answer in this way that the singleton objects are always created in heap and whenever multiple requests are added to a application 
a thread is created and each thread has its own private stack memory which is independent of each other so every time a new request come a new stack memory is allocated to that thread and then those particular threads have their own specific values that cannot be manipulated by other threads while the object that you want to use <laughs> is in heap so multiple threads can point to the same object in the heap and they can execute in parallel without overriding each other's value because they each of the values are intact in their own particular stack so each thread is able to point to the same reference in the heap memory of the dao bean so even if it is one multiple threads points to it and make the task done so it's all about the memory how it is allocated okay <clears throat> so you have given a two table uh, how will you join them in object oriented manner okay so tables are something that we use in relational databases and pojos are something that we use in object oriented programming so to connect these two concepts we have one framework in place that is jpn hibernate so jpn hibernate provides a way to map two pojos like we can do the two table join that is the mapping annotations okay and what type of mappings are allowed in hibernate or jpn so there are four types of mappings that are allowed in hibernate so if i have an employee class i have an address class i can have one to one mapping where one employee resides at one address only i can have one to many mapping where one employee can reside at multiple addresses then many to one mapping there can be a case that many students live at one hostel and many to many mapping like one employee existing in multiple addresses and one address can be allocated to multiple employees in many to many case we have the third table created that is address employee mapping table where both the ids will be kept and the combination of the both the ids will be the primary key for that third table created okay so have you worked on microservices yes so currently we have been working in a monolithic architecture but now recently we have received a request to since it is very difficult to manage the whole big monolithic application at one place with 30 team of people it is difficult to manage the whole data and application so now we are moving slowly steadily towards the microservice architecture so yes we are in process of creating the pocs and implementing them in the real projects okay so can you tell me like what are the microservices and uh what are the advantages of microservices over the monolithic application right so what i have found while working with the microservice architecture is we were a team of 30 people managing each and every person uh, segregating the task between 30 people was a difficult task so with microservice architecture what we have done is we have segregated the whole application monolithic application into multiple domains and we have divided the team of 5 5 into 6 teams and each team is responsible for one microservice architecture so now it's very easy to delegate the task to the team and also it is very easy to scale and deploy it independently so with microservice architecture we have we have a better team coordination we have a better deployments better responsibility segregations in many such things that i have found with microservice architecture so that is how if you even if you have not worked with the microservice architecture if, even if you know something you you can speak about it that you have started working on it and you have started creating pocs on it and it is still in progress so you might not uh, be expert in it but you are familiar with the technology so that is how you should explain that to the interviewer for more such questions just let me know in the comment section what all things i should cover i'll cover those companies and those interview questions for you in the next video i'll be waiting for your responses in the comments please let me know and help us out with the next video thank you so much guys bye bye